All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Betty Bianza. I am an educational aide with Open Space Authority. And today we have a wonderful program with docent extraordinaire, um, Michael Hawk. He is gonna be talking about the surprising biodiversity of the suburban yard. Um, so during COVID-19 stay at home orders, when they hit back in March, 2020, um, Michael turned to his backyard to connect with nature. And today we're gonna learn how his love of photography and interest in, his, um, in, his, in nature, big or small, started a one-year journey of discovery, which showed that amazing wildlife is all around us. And um, for questions, we do have our Q&A function. So if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see that little bar pop up. It's the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please use that function. And then in the chat, you can use the chat to kind of chat back and forth with us, um, but it's easier for us to keep track when Michael will be stopping for questions. Um, he has certain slides where he's gonna be prompting for questions. It's easier for me to keep track um, when you use that function, then we can kind of check them off on our end. Um, so thank you so much all for being here. Uh, Michael, throwing it off to you. Okay, I'll uh, get the share going. And, uh, and we'll get started. So yeah, hello and, and thank you, and especially thank you to Betty and the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority for inviting me to present today. Uh, as was stated, my name is Michael Hawk and I'm a docent with the authority. So today I'm gonna tell you uh, about the surprising biodiversity that I found big and small in my generally mismanaged backyard, at least until recently, I'm trying to do better. And um, a bit about more about me and my yard here in a few minutes. So one of the motivations that I had to present today came from the fact that I really like documentaries, nature documentaries in particular on TV. But the one thing that has never really sat right with me is how they often present a world where nature is remote and exotic and hard to get to, you know, in a word, inaccessible. So today I hope to show that you can actually find amazing nature right in your own yard. And if you happen not to have a yard, this could easily be a nearby city park or a weedy undeveloped lot. And, you know, something else that I realized in this process is that our personal properties and turf grass in particular, if you add up the area that they take up in the US, it's about the same size as the state of Florida. So we'll talk a little bit about the light bulbs that went off during the year and a little bit about how we can improve the biodiversity potential in our own yards. So I do have a lot of slides, a lot of photos. It's going to be pretty fast paced. Like Betty said, I'll stop at a few points for questions. So please, you know, go in the chat and enter those. Uh, hopefully that you'll enjoy the photography and the story as we go. And um, like I like to say, remember, if you don't look, you won't see anything. And that applies to your yard as well. Since uh, I am actually in San Jose, I got a little bit ahead of myself. I'm in San Jose, California. Uh, so if any of you are in other parts of the country, as we saw, we have Phoenix and uh, San Luis Obispo, and I'm sure other as well a lot of the same principles apply. So you might not see the exact same species, but you'll see the same genus or the same sorts of things. So where do we begin? Well, as was alluded to, this little nasty virus. So my employer was one of the first to respond with a mandatory work from home. It was a two week work from home request of our uh, employees, but it really didn't take a rocket scientist to understand that we were in for something that was much longer than two weeks. So had a whole bunch of exciting trips that were planned and family vacation. And it was obvious to me that those plans were no more, but I was really lucky. You know, my job was minimally impacted. I could continue to work from home. So there was really nothing I could do, but make the best of the situation. If I wasn't going to get to go on those trips, I would go in my backyard. So I started to take daily lunch breaks in my backyard and, you know, being interested in wildlife, I would notice the birds and photograph the birds. So that led to an idea to promote backyard habitats and the wildlife that we could see in our own backyard. I spur of the moment created this Facebook group, hoping I could connect more people with nature and this concept, make the best of the situation. I really didn't have a specific plan though. It was sort of spur of the moment thing. I figured I'd invite some friends and see what happens, start taking some pictures and sharing. My initial goal was just to share one photo every day. And that turned into, if I could, a new species every day. 
And being time bound just to lunch breaks, it meant that I couldn't always get high quality photos, but I still strive to get identifiable photos. So like, this is a good example. This is one of the first things I posted, a golden crown sparrow that was deep within a shrub in my backyard. It could have easy, easily been overlooked, but because I was out there searching and wanting to share, I found it and shared it. Not the best photo though. But the next day, things got a little bit more interesting. I found this bush tit that was gathering nesting material. And I want to make a quick side note about putting out nesting material for birds. You do have to be careful and make sure that they're safe. Things like yarn and strings and dryer lint are generally not safe for birds. They could have detergents or chemicals and the yarn and strings can um, actually be restrictive. So if you do plan to put out nesting material, please take a few minutes and do your research to make sure that it's safe. And occasionally I would get a nice shot. This is a white crown sparrow and check out the length of those toes and claws. I think that's just amazing to see the uh, adaptations that these birds have up close like that. So wait, okay, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I, I promised you that I would tell you more about my yard and myself. So let's go ahead and do that. As I said, I'm in San Jose in California. That's in the San Francisco Bay area. I'm in the Southeast corner of the city. So that little red circle in the middle there where there's a blue pin, that's approximately where my house is. My yard is about 6,100 square feet. So it's, uh, I think by US standards considered to be small by San Jose standards, probably average. And it has a lawn, it has citrus trees, rose bushes, other ornamentals, but thankfully a few native plants. And we'll talk more about that later. And who am I? Well, I'm a longtime nature enthusiast that got into it through hiking and photography and then birding. And in the last year, kind of everything. So I now, I consider myself a naturalist now. And a few years ago, I realized that I really wanted nature to be my next career. So I've been spending a lot of time learning, volunteering, like with the Open Space Authority and other groups and working on my communication. And I even started a nature podcast that I know one of the guests here today mentioned. So thank you for listening. And uh, you can see the camera gear that I used as well, in case any of you are photographers and um, are interested in that. So back to the yard. So my idea was evolving a little bit. I mentioned starting with that Facebook group, I just wanted one species every day. And, uh, and I thought, well, okay, finding a new species every day is gonna be very hard, especially in winter. So what if I just say in bulk, I get 365 photographed animal species in the course of a year. I never really wrote down specific rules. So it was just uh, an idea in my head, but I, I figured that if a bird flew over my yard, I would count that. Um, and there's a lot of times where you can't actually identify a specific species. We'll talk more about that as well. So I had to be certain that whatever I was counting was not a duplicate. So like for a lot of insects, you can maybe get to genus. Sometimes you can't even get to genus and identification. So I had to be careful not to double count. So I am most knowledgeable about birds and that was my natural initial focus, especially early on. And here's a couple more, an oak titmouse and a California scrub jay with a peanut. And we're lucky here in the Bay Area to have hummingbirds year round. And we also have a few hummingbirds that migrate through. So the Anna's hummingbird on the left is a year round species and the Allen's hummingbird on the right comes through during migration. There's a very similar looking hummingbird called the Rufus hummingbird. Take, take my word on the IDs. They're actually very difficult to tell apart. You have to, to be certain, see a tail feather notch on the Rufus hummingbird to tell. And, and for these, I was actually able to see it, but I just couldn't get a good photograph. So I'm pretty confident. But as you can see, it was sort of the backyard megafauna that had my attention. You know, the squirrels, the big butterflies, and, you know, I keep saying backyard, but if you take a look at the alligator lizard on the rightmost picture, you can tell it's, uh, it's thermoregulating underneath the shade of a tire. And that was actually in my front yard. So really, really it's my whole yard. So like I said, I wanted 365 photographed animal species but my back of the envelope math suggested that maybe I could get about 65 of these backyard megafauna that I just mentioned. But thankfully, arthropods. 
And my interest in insects and arthropods up until that point was kind of like, if I happened to stumble across something interesting, I'd take a photograph of it and maybe try to identify it, learn a little bit about it. So I, I had a cursory knowledge of insects and spiders, but not very much. I never specifically searched them out. So again, doing that math, I was going to need to find about 300 arthropods to get to that 365 total number. So for me, just do it, the Nike phrase, I know it's a little cliche, but it really is a bit like a motto for me. Like a lot of quotes and a, a lot of mottos, there's meaning that's just packed into it, personal meaning that's packed into it. So what for me it does is it reminds me not to be a perfectionist. It reminds me that I'll learn a lot more and I'll learn faster if I start sooner. So just get started. But strangely, I felt some sort of internal resistance to actually setting or even telling anyone about my goal of 365 species. I suppose nobody really wants to fail. And I had no idea if it was even possible, but you know, I thought, well, okay, let's just, just do it. <laughs> so I started realizing that even if I came up short, I was gonna have a lot of fun in the process. I was gonna refine my photography skill I was going to learn a lot about the animals that are around us. And that all turned out to be true. So like I said, I'd head outside over lunch for 20 or 30 minutes, whatever I had time for. Occasionally I'd be lucky and I get a break at some other point in the day and head out as well. But what I noticed was for the first 10 minutes or so, I'd really only see the obvious things, the birds, the butterflies, those megafauna, you know, that I was talking about, maybe a bumblebee. But after about 10 minutes of being out there, looking, focusing, the magic would happen. I'd switch into what I call full observation mode and I'd really start seeing things like this tiny, Liri, I, I always have trouble saying this, Lirio Miza fly. And you can see a, a close up on the right. So I was fascinated by this sort of 10 minute transition that I just mentioned was very consistent. I noticed it day after day. So I did a little bit of digging into the phenomenon and I found a whole bunch of interesting things. I'm, you know, an engineer by day. So I, I love technical documents and, and papers. I won't bore you with all of that, but bear with me with, for at least a short detour into the world of neuroscience. So as smart as we think we are, our brains are obviously far from perfect. I mean, we see, <laughs> we see examples of that all the time, just read the news. And there's not really a perfect analogy for how our brains work, but you know, a consistent one that people use is computers. So our brains receive about 11 million bits per second of data from all of our sensors, our sight, our touch, our smell. You know, what does that really mean though? That's a big number, 11 million bits. Um, to put it into something maybe that's a little more tangible, it's, it's slightly more than two simultaneous high definition movie streams. Now, maybe that doesn't sound like much data or maybe it does to you, but it doesn't really matter because what matters is despite all that data coming in, we can only consciously process about 60 to 120 bits per second. So yeah, that's not a typo. I was saying millions of bits coming in, but tens of bits that we can process. So how do we survive only being able to process 60 to 120 bits consciously? Well, obviously there are a lot of things our body just does subconsciously. So that doesn't count. That's, you know, another category, but our brains figured out a way around this. We create something called heuristics or shortcuts that allow us to make assumptions and skip decision-making. So you may have heard of the concept of developing a search image. You know, this is actually a type of heuristic and an example that uh, I think sometimes drives people crazy uh, when this happens to me is I'll be looking for something, maybe it's at the grocery store or in the cabinet at home, and it'll be right in front of me, but I can't find it, I don't see it. And it's because the packaging changed. My search image didn't match what reality was. So you can actually use this knowledge to help you find interesting plants, animals, insects, and more by just spending some time in advance looking at pictures of things that you're hoping to see. And perhaps equally important to this concept of a search image is we also have something called an attentional filter that wakes us up when important things happen. And your brain has to learn what's important. I mean, some of it's a little instinctual, but some of it's learned behavior. You know, so for example, if you're in the savanna and you hear rustling grass, 
that might be a lion that's about to pounce. Your brain is going to wake you up to that risk and, uh, and you're going to become aware of it. So you can train this attentional filter with a little bit of effort. And it also helps to have that search image too. And if you're interested, there's really a fun exercise you can do on YouTube. If you search for basketball awareness test later, you can see how effective our intentional filters really are. We are blind to so much that's going on around us because of this. So when I learned about that and practiced, you know, things like this really started to jump out at me. And this is a close up of a crab spider that I think it's a thrip perhaps that it caught. And another really great example of the things I started to see is this tiny weevil. And from a distance, it looks like bird excrement. But when I was walking by, instead of just thinking there was a little, little piece of bird excrement on a flower petal, I could just tell that this was not bird excrement. It looked closer and sure enough, it's just a crazy looking little weevil. And a few other examples, a monarch egg on the left, which is just beautiful when you look at it up close and a lacewing egg on the right. The lacewing egg, by the way, is probably one of the easiest to find insect eggs in a yard. They're often scattered and singular. Sometimes you'll find them in clusters, but they look like this little balloon attached to a uh, filament sticking up. And once you see one, you know, once that search image is formed, you'll see them all over the place. And here you can see some of the drama that happened at a small scale. We had marigolds planted and they attracted the marigold fruit fly. And where there are flies, uh, there's going to be spiders. So <laughs> this jumping spider had no trouble capturing one of these marigold fruit flies for lunch. So as I alluded to earlier, I did, really didn't know what I was getting into with insects. And having never taken an entomology class, I really had a lot to learn. And that was okay, but here's an example. And just to prove the point. So um, what are these two insects? You can reply in, uh, in chat and, uh, and Betty will help uh, you know, with the response. You can say left one is X and right one is Y, or maybe you don't know what, you know what one is, but not the other, but let me know what you think. I'll give you a few seconds. Any guesses? Not yet. Um, so if you, oh, sorry, they are um, in the Q&A. Uh, we have someone thinking that the left one is a green stink bug. I also <laughs> believe it might be a green stink bug as well. Um, and any guesses for that one on the right, folks? Is it a larva of the ladybug, maybe? Yeah, that's actually that's actually a pretty good guess. So rather than put you through the torture of uh, <laughs> guessing, it's actually the same species. So Rick, you are correct. It's a green stink bug. And what you have on the left is the adult. And on the right, it's the nymph. And if you saw these in real life, you would see that not only do they look different by shape and proportion and color, but by size, uh, the one on the left is actually about 20 times bigger, I would estimate, than the one on the right. So I was certain I had a new species when I found the larva, um, or excuse me, the nymph. Uh, but I had to learn. <laughs> I had to learn that, oh, wait, no, that's actually the same thing. It's just a different life stage. So to help me in that learning, thankfully, I had started using iNaturalist. And this is not a presentation about iNaturalist. There's tons of resources about that, but just to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page about what this thing is. Uh, iNat, as people call it, it's an app that you can have on your phone and a website that you can log all types of observations, any type of life, it be plant, animal, insect, whatever. And what you do is you upload a photo and a machine learning algorithm will offer ID suggestions Sometimes it won't be able to give you a specific ID. It may only get you down to order or family or genus. Sometimes it can't even do that. It just says, don't know. 
but very often it gives you something helpful. And that's combined with all sorts of other data. Um, there's, there's sightings maps, there's calendars of sightings. So you can see if this thing is around the time of year you saw it, uh, similar taxa pictures, life history information. So you can use all this data to help you zero in on what the ID might be. And part of the beauty of this is you don't need to do all that yourself. In fact, it's often better to be safe and leave your observation at a higher level taxa, like a genus or family level, because then enthusiasts and experts will come along through kind of a social media sort of element that they have, and they'll help you identify. They'll give suggestions and tell you why. And it opens up this huge window into being able to comment and collaborate with experts. It's just, it's just amazing. And here's an example for me. I submitted this aphid. I knew it was an aphid. I didn't need INAT to tell me that, but I really didn't know what species it was. So I submitted this observation and just like a day later, somebody who did know came along and offered up their suggestion, which I was able to look into. And I found out this person seems to know a lot about aphids based on their profile and the suggestion matched. So here I go. I actually know what the species is now. Anyway, I'm really addicted to it. <laughs> I have to admit it's opened my eyes to so many different plant and animal species that I certainly would have overlooked before. I see what other people in my area are seeing and that, cur that triggers curiosity to go try to find certain things myself. It's basically, it provides an endless pursuit of knowledge and novelty. There are projects as well that focus on backyards. So you can even see what people are seeing in their own yards and, uh, and get ideas as to what you might be able to see. So um, anyway, a year ago, I, I was aware of INAT but I only had like six observations submitted in four years of, of use. And now suddenly about a year later, I'm zeroing in on 4,000 observations and 1600 species reported. So it's, uh, you can see my obsession. So the Western lynx spider, which is one of the more common spiders in my yard, wants to know, do you have any questions so far? If you have any questions, you're welcome to put those in that Q&A function. If you just kind of scroll down and um, of your, on the bottom of your screen, a bar will pop up and it's that Q&A with a little two um, speech bubbles like our Western Link spider has. I think we are okay. We do not have any questions so far. I am impressed about how many observations you have. That is incredible. Um, you well, and to be clear, that's, <laughs> yeah. And that's not just from my yard. A, a lot of that's from my yard, but you know, I, I do occasionally get out and hike in the open space properties and other places and I'll, I'll get, submit observations from there as well. Um, oh. and on a side note, that's actually another thing is, uh, you know, what I've learned from my yard and through iNaturalist makes it so much more enjoyable when I do go on hikes because I have, a little bit more of a frame of reference as to what the things are that I'm seeing. And I stop and look at the flowers and find the insects and so forth. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. Oh, we do have a question. Um, Stuart asks, do you have any water feature like a pond or a bird bath in your yard? And have you considered putting one in? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And that would certainly bring a lot more diversity to your yard. Uh, I do have a bird bath and mm -hmm. um, I, I have it placed in the shade. It's kind of hidden. It doesn't attract a ton of, of things, but I, I have to admit my neighbor has a koi pond. And uh, I think that that probably is why I had so many dragonfly species. Um, I, I don't know that I have any dragonfly pictures here in this presentation, but there, there were a good 10 dragonfly species that I was able to get probably because of that neighbor's pond. And we have another question about um, iNaturalist, if it will work on your laptop or computer because their cell phone is causing them trouble. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, it's more full featured through the through a desktop or through a laptop. So the, the, the app that you get on the phone will uh, maybe give you about 70% of the total feature set. So yeah, check it out. You can just go to, um, to iNaturalist. I have some contact information at the end. Um, feel free to email me uh, and I can send you links to the help guides and you know how to get started. Perfect. Um, so. And I did add your Facebook group, your podcast, 
the YouTube video and the iNaturalist website to the chat. So for folks that are um, interested in checking that out, um, you can click on those links and um, open them up and you know save them for after the presentation. It Thank you for that. Like, yeah, no problem. It looks like we are good and um, with questions and. Okay, we'll uh, we'll move along to perhaps my favorite discovery in the backyard. So quickly, I found these little flies called flower flies or hover flies. And I think for a long time, I thought most of these were actually bees. And it's because they're actually bee and wasp mimics. And they're important pollinators as well. And their larvae actually serve as controls, you know, biological controls for a lot of pests. So they're great to have in your, um, in your garden. They're also really charismatic for some of the best flyers on earth. They're right up there with dragonflies in terms of their ability to fly and have wonderful color patterns and perhaps even better names. Like look at this Western calligrapher and oblique stripe tail. You know, how can you not love that? So, so uh, I skipped the slide somehow. Um, so this picture here, it's not actually the sharpest, but I think it's pretty fun uh, because it's actually a selfie. So if you look really closely, can you see me in there? And while you're looking for that, uh, also notice how many wings that the fly has. And I'll come back to that here in a minute. So ta-da, there's my head. Um, so that shiny brownish area, it's called the scutum, and you can see my head leaning in to get the photo. And uh, above my head is some rose leaves from a rose bush that was nearby. So I thought that was kind of fun. And uh, these are very small flies. So I had to get pretty close to take this picture and in order to see my uh, reflection there. Oh yeah, I have this problem sometimes where it skips two slides. This happened to me before too. So go back and a couple more, uh, margin calligrapher and a thick legged hoverfly. There were, you know, I, I should have added up the number of flower flies that I saw in my yard. Uh, I, I don't recall off the top of my head, but I think it was close to 20 species. So there's really a lot of diversity here. And, you know, like I said, they're mimics of bees and wasps. And to help you identify and find these, you know, here's a couple of tips. So there are over 850 flower fly species in the United States, and they are flies. So when distinguishing them from bees, one, the first thing you look at is how many wings do they have? So flies will have two wings, bees have four wings. Sometimes it's hard to see the four wings on the bees, but uh, bees typically don't hover in the same way that a hoverfly or flower fly does. So that's another tip off to maybe look a little closer. And the flower flies have other fly anatomy, like the bulging eyes and the very short antenna. And they generally don't carry pollen in the same way that bees do. So they don't have those same um, features to, to pack pollen in or um, they aren't as hairy as bees are to, to capture as much pollen, but they do, they are pollinators. And there's a superb online guide as well um, that uh, uh, I listed here that helps you with identification beyond even what iNaturalist does. So just a couple more of the flower flies that, uh, that I found. And in addition to the flower flies being such a surprising discovery, the spider diversity in my yard has been another really great surprise. And uh, I do see there's a question in the queue. I'll, I'll get to a pause point here in just a moment. Um, so I, I saw in the last year, 26 different arachnid species. And I know that there were other ones that I just couldn't identify. You know, spiders like, like a lot of uh, arthropods can be very difficult to identify. So here's a couple of good examples, another Western lynx spider with prey. And on the right, this is interesting to me as well. It just shows how much variance there is. That's actually a black widow with a, uh, a beetle. And it's a juvenile female black widow. So it hasn't turned all black yet. I, I thought for sure I had a new species, but it turns out uh, just a, uh, just a juvenile. And on observation, you can see it's a huge array of hunting strategies employed by spiders. So the, the two, I, um, well, the, the link spider anyway, on the previous slide, it's actually an ambush hunter. So it's going to go out and chase prey down or hide and jump and, and, and catch prey. Uh, kind of like the crab spider I showed earlier. But these two spiders I show here, they actually use webs to passively catch their prey. 
And I think the one on the left uh, was my, it's definitely my favorite spider that I found. It's called a trash line orb weaver. And it's named that because it takes the carcasses of its prey and decorates its web in this line. Uh, and the theory as to why it does this, it creates this trash line is so that it can actually uh, hide itself in amongst the trash from its predators because there are predators of spiders too. So you can see it there in the, in the very middle of this trash line, that's the orb weaver. And the spider on the right, it's called a marbled cellar spider. It's actually a non-native spider, but turned out to be very, very common. And like a lot of spiders, if it's disturbed, it will violently shake its web to try to ward off the threat. And I have to tell you, when you're leaning in very close to take a photo and it starts doing this, it, it's a quite effective tactic, even though I'm you know, so many thousands of times bigger than it, I, uh, it got me. <laughs> Oh, and a couple other spiders here. Here's a, an adult black widow and a jumping spider, which I've come to learn some people actually raise jumping spiders as pets, surprisingly. More spiders. Can't always identify them like the maybe orb weaver on the right, but uh, it's always fun to see a bunch of spiderlings and um, I guess if you have arachnophobia, maybe not so much, but, uh, but for me, it was fun. And okay, I need to cut myself off with the spiders. I admit this is the last one. It's the, it's called a button hook leaf beetle jumping spider. Another very common backyard spider here in, in San Jose. And perhaps one of the more charismatic ones. I mean, look at it peeking around this little stalk. And I also learned not to forget to look at night. There's a lot of insects that only come out at night. And some estimates say that it could be as many as 40% or 45% of all insect species. Other people even think it could be as much as 50% of insect species come out at night. And that sort of makes sense. There's a whole niche to fill during the night. So I did something called light trapping to photograph these insects. And it doesn't really involve trapping. It's more like attracting. So. Light trapping 101, you basically hang up a white cloth or a white sheet or something, wait until dark, shine a bright light on it. And thus far, as far as I can tell, the, the profit part here is just figurative, but I don't know, if you have ideas, let me know. This was my first attempt. I'd never seen anyone do it. I just read about it. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna string up a line, hang up a sheet. This case, a very wrinkly sheet that I pulled, you know, out of the deep recesses of my closet. So wrinkles optional, but uh, not optional is to secure it so that the wind doesn't blow it too much. And it turned out that this was way too big because just a little bit of wind would cause it to shake and move. And it made it very difficult to observe and photograph. Uh, but keep in mind that many different insects appear at different times of the night as well. So it's worthwhile checking at various times. And one of the big payoffs of light trapping or light attracting is moths. So here's a couple examples of, uh, of some of the interesting moths I found. Unfortunately, I didn't get any like really colorful tiger moths or, or things like that, but these are still fascinating creatures in and of themselves. So with that, the woodland skipper <laughs> wants to know if you have any questions. We do have a few questions. I just want to let you know that I cannot get enough of jumping spiders. They're absolutely my favorite. They are adorable. I did not know that people have them as pets. And I think I would love to do, to do that. Check YouTube. Like there's. Uh, <laughs> I am yeah. definitely will. Uh, we have a Rick Herter asking um, about the calligrapher. Uh, it's such a great name. Do you know why it might be called that? Yeah, um, I, I believe it's called that. And I could probably back up my slide here real quick. Um, well, actually, that's that's a ways back. So maybe that's dangerous to do. We did not have to re-fast forward. But mm -hmm. if you look at the pattern that it has on its back, it looks like calligraphy. And um, there's a, a number of different calligraphers that uh, that exist. And there's an Eastern calligrapher. And you know, there, I, forget, I think there's like maybe 10 or 12 in the US. And they all have a very intricate calligraphy type pattern on their back. Whereas some of the other ones that aren't, you know, in that same genus, they still have an interesting pattern, but it's more like straight lines or spots or, you know, things like that. Wow. Thank you. Uh, we have John Bronner asking about um, the camera and lens combo for your macro photography and 
flash if you're using flash when you're taking these pictures. Yeah, um, I, I'm using a Canon 7D Mark II DSLR, uh, which is, I don't even know, five, six years old now. Um, and uh, most of my macro photos are with an older 100 millimeter lens. Uh, and I do use a flash. So when I started this, I had a ring flash and uh, you know, ring flash kind of makes things look flat sometimes. So it, the flash actually blew up one day. <laughs> it, it literally blew up. <laughs> uh, so I had to get a new flash. I got a cheaper one that, that has like two different um, uh, adjustable sort of uh, flashlights on it. So that's what I use these days. And that's really helpful because with macro, you're usually stopping down. You're not getting much light. So, that, so you need all that extra light. Uh, it does create some artifacts sometimes. Um, you know, like even this woodland skipper I have here, that was with flash and you can see that the lighting doesn't look super natural, but, um, it brings out the detail. Great. Thank you. And we have James asking, um, is macro lens essential for insect ID on iNaturalist? Oh, it certainly helps. Um, so one, one tip for insect ID on iNat is to try to get multiple angles of the insect, even if you don't have a macro. Um, the different angles are certainly going to be helpful, but uh, you know, oftentimes it's very subtle markings that help you with the ID. And, and by the way, there are some great macro lenses, even for phones. Uh, so, uh, that's something else you can look into, but with a phone, you have to get pretty close to the insect and you might scare it away, but there's, there's options out there anyway. Yeah. Thank you. And we have a question from Stuart. Have you ever observed a whole leaf or more of aphids at the same time? I'll let you yeah. answer that one. <laughs> yeah, many times. <laughs> and then have you ever noticed a wave of movement within the mass of aphids as if they are all responding to some external stimulus? Yeah, uh, that, that happens quite a bit. And I think where I see it most frequently is in the oleander aphid, which is a frequent pest on milkweed. And they're a, a, like a vibrant yellow aphid. And you'll see them like kind of all stand up and, and, and shake at the same time. Um, I, I've read different accounts as to why that might be. I, I don't know for sure, but some of the accounts claim that it might it might be a way to scare off or ward off predators um, because it looks like a you know consolidated mass movement. Wow, I have yet to observe that. I will need to start keeping an eye out <laughs> for all of that. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. and um, I think we are clear on the questions. Great, then we'll move along. So. You know, I always knew that plants were critically important. And I've heard people say that, and especially native plants. Um, but for some reason, it never really fully soaked in. So you know, I, I mentioned that I'd planted some native plants largely because people said, just do it. Um, and what I noticed after this year of observation is really how critically important they are. It really drove home the point. So a little mini ecology lesson. So plants, of course, are what's required in nature to convert sunlight into carbohydrates, which is the base food for everything else that you see in this trophic pyramid here. So they're called primary producers because that's, that's what turns light into food. And every layer above that is dependent on this base layer. It's also very, you know, it's kind of inefficient. We only transfer about 10% of the energy to each layer that's above so it makes you realize just how much plant volume you really need to support all of this life. And I'm sure we can all think of insects that eat our plants like aphids we were just talking about or caterpillars, which are you know, critical for birds. Uh, and animals then that eat the insects, you know, like the birds and the lizards and frogs and so forth. Uh, but there's a lot of other really interesting examples that I wanna show you. Oh, I did it again. Um, so check out this stem here. There's a couple of squiggly lines on it. So another question for all of you, does anyone have a theory as to what this squiggly line is? Maybe what caused it? If folks just want to add that to the chat. Um, I can get your answers to Michael that way. I know it takes a while to type, so I'll be patient here. By the way, while, uh, while I'm waiting for some guesses as to what that might be, this stem is from a milkweed. 
I don't know that that's a hint. It's just, just telling you what it is. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing any guesses. So we have one guess. Oh. My guess is thinking maybe it is fungus of some sort. We have James thinking it might be a beetle. Um, ebony, I hopefully I'm saying that right. Um, caterpillar or sandy leaf miners. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Sandy is probably the closest there with leaf miner. This is uh, a related sort of behavior called stem mining. And let me tell you a little bit about it. So what happens is a, an insect comes along and has a special ovipositor to insert an egg into the stem. And that egg hatches, the larva then starts to develop and it chews its way underneath this epidermis layer of the stem. And that pathway you see there is the route that the larva took as it was growing up. And eventually then it uh, becomes an adult. It chews its way out and takes off as an adult. There's a number of flies and um, um, moths and, uh, and other species of insects that have all developed the same adaptation. And what an incredible strategy that is. I mean, you're protected in there, chewing your way to adulthood, to adulthood with all of this food in the comfort and protection of the stem. So these stem mining insects are especially fascinating, at least to me, because they are so specialized. They often seek out a particular genus or even a particular species of plant. So that's called an obligate relationship. So they're obligated. And if that plant were to disappear, they would disappear as well. And I found a whole bunch of examples of obligate relationships in my own yard, ranging from certain butterflies and aphids to uh, certain wasp, wasp species and even some fungi. Uh, so that opened my eyes further as to the importance of plants and plant diversity leading to insect diversity and biodiversity in general, because uh, without, without these specific plants, those specific obligate insects would not be here. And, um, okay, here we go. Here's another very common, uh, this one is a leaf miner, as uh, Sandy suggested, that you can find on rose bushes. So if you have a rose bush, you might want to look for these in a few weeks to throughout the summer. And again, same pattern here. You can see in the lower part of the leaf, a very narrow little mine path that's squiggling along and it slowly gets wider as the larva got larger and larger. And that black line is the frass that it left behind. So with a little bit of knowledge about the plant species and also the pattern of the mine, you can very often identify the species that did this without having ever seen it. And one person uh, who is a true expert in this, Charlie Eisman, I have a, a link here to his website. He's created a 1400 page field guide basically with, uh, with keys to help you identify these insects. It's super cool. And again, I found um, several leaf mining species in my own yard. So, we have a lot of non-native plants, like I said, and we inherited some of those. And during this last year, it really became starkly obvious that our non-natives were really almost invisible to most of the insects. And yeah, there's some invasive insects, some, you know, from other, other countries or continents and snails, and maybe a few generalists that might try out these plants, but really all the action was on the natives. And it makes sense. Plants and insects are locked in an evolutionary battle. The plants don't want the insects to eat them, so they create a variety of chemicals and toxins to dissuade the insects, and then the insects evolve specific strategies to get around that. So native plants and native insects have millennia of coevolution. So no wonder when you introduce a plant that came from South America or Asia or Europe that our local insects just don't even know what to make of it. There's nothing they can do with it. And for me, the all-star of my backyard, just to give an example, because everywhere has something that's probably equivalent to this, was the California coffee berry. It's drought tolerant, provides berries and cover, dozens of pollinator species. I found, um, I did find leaf mining species on this as well. And it's the first place I go in my backyard uh, when I'm looking for, for any sort of wildlife. And it's pretty quickly followed by some of my other natives. And while the whole backyard observation project really started with animals, it led to so much more. And I think these lichen are a really good example. 
I lived here and I was aware of lichen for, I mean, I've known about lichen for 20, 25 years. I lived in this house for 10 years and I never took the time to even notice that I had a bunch of lichen species in my own yard. So what is lichen? Just a quick uh, overview. They're symbiotic relationships between a fungi and an algae or a fungi and a cyanobacteria. And I'm not really confident enough to identify what these species in particular are, but for context as to where these turned up, going from upper left around sort of clockwise, uh, it was on a rose bush, an orange tree, the concrete of my patio, and my fence. So it's amazing that these turned up in so many different places. And, and this is just, this is about half of the lichen species I was able to find. So why care about lichen? Well, they're obviously just super interesting and, and beautiful creatures, but some of these are also used by, by hummingbirds, for example, to camouflage their nest, and they have tiny microbiomes within them as well. It's uh, very interesting. So what all of this has really led up to me is to understand how critically important our personal property is as habitat. Like I mentioned at the beginning, one of the amazing statistics that I found is if you add up the area of all of the turf grass in the United States, in aggregate, it takes up as much land as the state of Florida. So imagine if we went into Florida and just overnight turned all of the state into grass and treated it just like we do with our own lawns or most people treat their own lawns and started dumping pesticides and fertilizers and fungicides and you know other things onto it. Think of the impact of biodiversity that that would have. Now, of course, in reality, this sort of mismanagement, mismanagement isn't happening in aggregate like that. It's happening slowly in small patches across the country all the time, fragmenting habitat and weakening our ecosystems. So it's still really a dire situation. Um, yeah, you know, because all of these hab habitats are part of ecosystems. And I stress the word system here because everything really is interconnected. So this again, a little overly simplistic uh, diagram here, but just to, just to show the point, all these animals that we get in our yard, they're the hooks in John Muir's quote that was on the previous slide. So it means that really everything is part of a broader habitat and when we're thinking about our yard, like in my case, I'm close to some parks and some open spaces. So there's, there's a lot of movement of insects and animals from neighbor's yards or from the neighboring parks through and in my yard. So if I'm not supporting that wildlife, that is weakening their possibility, their chances to survive. So supporting amazing wildlife in your yard, you have to improve the food, the shelter and the health of your habitat. So for me, it's kind of too, two easy steps. <laughs> um, the first step is plant native plants. I'll talk a bit about that. And the second step, my favorite step is just to be lazy. So starting with the native plants, think about plants that grow in your immediate region, the closer to your home, the better, the closer to your own habitat or that your excuse me, your own, um, uh, you know, weather and climate, probably the better because it will require less work for you to maintain. And, you know, the best thing you can do is just start. You don't necessarily need to be perfect. You don't need to tear up your entire lawn. Uh, but if you can find a corner somewhere and just plant a few and the recommendation that, that I always have is try ideally to get three sizes of native plants, get something small, medium, and large, or you can think annual shrub and tree and get a cluster if possible, especially the small ones, because insects are, they, they much prefer seeing that they have options, that they have variety. It's not just one solitary plant that they have to rely on, but if they see three plants, then it's much more attractive to them. But again, it's just start. If you live in California, calscape.org is a great place to start to find out what you might be able to grow and find nurseries. And the Audubon Society for anywhere in the US has a native plants finder as well. So I, I highly recommend both of those resources. And when you're purchasing your plants, you really have to avoid systemic pesticides. And there's one that's pretty hot right now called neonicotinoids. And as a systemic, what growers can do is apply this when they're still, you know, at the wholesaler. And then you don't, I, I say, you don't have to worry about applying pesticide again. That's, that's their take on it because they can apply it once and it stays in the plant for potentially years. And this, plant then will be sold at your big box store nursery and taken home 
and you think you're doing something good by putting flowers out that your uh, that your insects are going to want, not realizing that you could be making them sick or killing them. So it's really important to ask and be careful about where you buy your plants. Um, and a lot of times stores can't even tell you. Uh, it's, it's really hard to find out this information, but typically the big box stores, everything is gonna be treated with, uh, with systemics. Um, so often you have to end up looking at uh, some of the smaller nurseries that maybe need your help more anyway. So, and, and of course, you know, the be lazy part, you too can stop using pesticides if you are using pesticides. That sometimes sounds like a big leap to make. We've all been conditioned for many, many years to use pesticides. If you, you know, the first sign of, a, of an aphid, um, you know, go out there and, and do something about it. And, you know, for me, I think of it this way. If you're trying to attract birds to your yard, you, you wouldn't put out bird poison in some other corner of your yard. So uh, to me, it's sort of the same thing. It might take your yard a couple of years to sort of renormalize, you know, so that you don't have these outbreaks. And those first couple of years might be a little bit harder and you might need to do something like insecticidal soap or spot treatments to get over it. But eventually you're gonna get what I had here, this picture. So those are those oleander aphids, the ones that will kind of all stand up and move at the same time that we were talking about before. And a lacewing or some lacewings saw this and they're like, wow, this is perfect for my babies. <laughs> so they went in and put all of these green eggs here. So in a couple of days, those are all going to hatch and the larva of the lacewing is going to go on a, uh, a food eating binge. And sure enough, those aphids would be gone in just a couple of days. So that's the sort of cycle that's normal in a, uh, in a good habitat. And one other thing, you know, since I know gardeners just hate aphids, um, so this one maybe is a, a little gruesome in a way. These are all dead aphids here. They've been parasitized thanks to some parasitoid wasps who literally go in and will um, insert their egg on or in the aphid. And the aphids sort of become little zombies. And the one on the right there, you see there's a circular hole that's actually made by the, by the wasp chewing its way out of the dead, dead aphid like a little trap door. So if you ever see aphids that are turning brown and very large, there's very likely a parasitoid wasp inside there that is able to live because this aphid existed in the first place. So that's another, another hook in John Muir's quote. And rodenticides. Um, in the Bay Area, I think in Phoenix as well, I know we had somebody on from Phoenix, there's a lot of citrus, uh, the weather's nice, there's a lot of rodent population. And the worst thing that we can do as stewards of the land is to use rodenticides because then you end up with a sick rodent that's out, not hiding, disoriented, and one of these beautiful raptors comes along and eats it. So the rodents will be back in a couple of days, but that predator, you know, the owl or the hawk, may take many years before it's before it comes back. They have much longer lifespans and much slower reproduction rates. So if you have rodents, uh, please find alternative ways to take care of it. So again, on the being lazy theme, a couple other things that are very, very helpful to native insects is uh, leave your leaf litter and don't prune your woody annuals or dead twigs until the spring. There's a lot of insects that will actually use the, the middle of dead twigs as overwintering or a spot for their larva. And in the springtime, then they'll, uh, they'll come out. Uh, this, I, I never was able to figure out what this is in the picture. I think it's a bee, um, but, uh, but this was something that, that I had accidentally pruned. And then I realized that there was a hollow hole in it and, um, and I wanted to see what was inside. And I found that there were every couple of inches on this twig uh, these bees in there. So I felt very bad that I had accidentally done that, but it kind of, it helped me realize, okay, I need to be more careful and leaves same way. A lot of insects, um, when they overwinter, they actually drop out of the vegetation that they're in, they'll go into the leaf or perhaps they'll go underground and, uh, and overwinter that way. So if you have some leaf litter, uh, it, it may not look nice to leave it on your lawn. So you can actually rake some of it up and just stick it in a corner somewhere in your yard. And, uh, and that's helpful as well. So, you know, 
just, you know, be lazy and <laughs> just, just shove it to the side instead of get rid of it. Okay. So yeah, my ask to you is, yeah, yes, you too can find amazing biodiversity despite my flawed yard with the lawn and with the roses and with some of these other things, you know, I was able to find all of these different things. So just try it out. And I recommend check at different times of the day, just sit and observe and let that attentional filter change. So you can start to see things, find your own hook. You know, for me, it was the animals and the birds. And then that sort of opened up all of these other doors. If you can add some native plants or focus on your native plants, and you'll start to see these connections, these ecological connections that are so important and treat your property like habitat. Um, if you do, you're going to have your own accessible nature sanctuary right outside your own back door. So to wrap up, how did I do? I'm still actually tabulating. I might be able to get to 320 or 325. These are still some mystery IDs out there, but I only ended up with 317. And, um, you know, so of course I was disappointed. I didn't get to 365, but it still unveiled all of these different things that, uh, that I didn't know about. And, you know, if there's anybody here from back East, for example, especially if you're East of the Mississippi, you should have no trouble in, in even a, um, uh, a yard that's been, you know, full of a, a lot of different non-native species to get 365, the uh, number of opportunity. I know people that have seen 300 leaf miners on their property back East. So uh, just get out there and look. If you can find 300 leaf miners, think of all the other things that are out there. So some links and other information here. I won't read through all this. You can see this if you're interested. Um, and with that, are there any other questions? Wow, thank you so much, Michael. That is so inspiring. <laughs> uh, we did have uh, maybe Gina uh, was thinking that maybe the animal in that twig was maybe a carpenter bee or mason bee. Um, could be yeah, that. very possible, yeah. We do have a question from Dale. Dale is um, wondering if you have any recommendation for native plants in our California yards, like milkweeds, et cetera. I know that you said your coffee berry is one of those um, ones that you go straight to because it supports a lot of life. Uh, do you have any other suggestions? Yeah, the, the coffee berry is great. And I, if I remember, Dale, I think you said you were in uh, San Luis Obispo when we were introducing at the very beginning. Um, so you'll probably have some different things specific to your locale, but across most of California, there's a variety of native buckwheats. So I would look for, for buckwheats. There's a lot of insects, a lot of butterflies that, that like buckwheats. Um, milkweeds, yes. Uh, there, there are some, some suggestions about how close you are to the coast and whether you plant milkweeds or not, because you know usually the overwintering sites are close to the coast and you don't want to have the temptation of larval food too close to the overwintering sites. Uh, so you do have to take a little bit of care there. Um, oak trees, if you have room for an oak tree, I mean, that's probably the, the, the best thing that you could plant. Um, but I do recommend that that Calscape website, it has great search functions by size, uh, location, if you have shade, the type of soil, all of that, and it should help you zero in. Great. Um, we have Betty from Northern Illinois just uh, mentioning how much she enjoyed your talk. And um, Ebony is also suggesting the coastal buckwheat is great for San Luis Obispo. We have another question from Stuart asking, have you intentionally planted some plants, flowers, or other plants to attract more species to your yard? If so, what kind did you plant? Yeah, um, I added the buckwheat uh, in my yard for that reason. It hasn't really, um, I added it middle of last year. Uh, so it hasn't really uh, taken off yet, but I added it to attract a variety of insects. Like when I've been out in nature, I sometimes see assassin bugs and butterflies and you know lots of different things on it. Um, so I, I have seen butterflies feeding on it of, uh, of a variety of types. Um, I, I, I think milkweed weeds are great. There's a little controversy over which species of milkweed. Generally, uh, you want to avoid tropical milkweed, which um, I did have some of that, uh, but there's different specific species for various locations. So uh, those are great to attract monarch butterflies and the flowers will attract a whole variety of different butterflies. So there's a couple that, that I've done. 
Great, thank you. And if for folks are um, looking for more information on that, um, I know Open Space Authority right now, we are um, promoting a, a project about monarch butterflies. So if you go to our social media, either Facebook or Instagram, I know that there are some posts about that that can give you a link to more information, or if you go to our website as well. I think that is all of the questions. Um, Thank you so much, Michael. This was so wonderful. And I love the be lazy part because, you know, it's just, you know, let nature do its thing. Um, and, you know, rodenticides and pesticides are one of the things that really can affect our animals. And nature kind of has a way of taking care of itself. Uh, you know, those ladybugs and praying mantis and all those wonderful things that are out there to kind of help with pests. Right. I mean, I only touched on the surface of, of all of those interactions that exist. And there's so many great resources. I know we're out of time, uh, but I, I just wanted to plug uh, an author, an ecologist, an entomologist who's an author named Doug Tallamy that has a couple of great books. Uh, one's called Bringing Nature Home, and the other one is Nature's Best Hope. And it really focuses on how you can make your own personal properties better habitat and how it's part of the puzzle that we need to solve here for, uh, for biodiversity. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. And thanks again, everyone for joining us. Uh, I did add a lot of those links that um, Michael was sharing during the presentation into the chat. So I will give you a moment to open those up if you would like to open them up and, um, and share. And we just have folks in the chat just really uh, thanking you for all of your valuable information and walking us through your journey. And, you know, we're learning from you as well. So thank you for sharing all of that information. Yeah, thank you. It was a lot of fun. I, uh, I appreciate it. All right, folks. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to stop our recording and I hope you had a chance to open up those links. Uh, if not, you can always 